Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Tech Trends webinar series. My name is Trevor Henderson, Technology Editor for Lab Manager, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on trends in environmental analysis. Today, we have a panel consisting of four experts in the field who have joined us to discuss some of the most current instruments, techniques, and research in the field of environmental science. We'd like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the presentation, and the panelists will address these during the question and answer session following the discussion. To ask a question, simply type your query into the Q&A box located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as possible during the Q&A session. If we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to the panelists, and they can respond to you via email. You may also move or resize any of the windows simply by grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right corner. At this time, you may need to move or minimize some of the windows to see the live view. This webinar recording will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. At the end of the webinar, we'll share that link with you as well as the contact information for all of our panelists. With that, let me introduce our first two speakers who join us from Thermo Fisher Scientific. Terry Christensen is a marketing specialist and application chemist for 10 years at Thermo Fisher Scientific and Dionics, developing and promoting ion chromatography applications to support new product introductions across all markets needing ionic determinations. In the last two years, her focus has been developing IC applications for the IC life sciences market and environmental food and safety markets. Prior to Thermo Fisher Scientific, she conducted material analysis and failure analysis and managed the same in teams and labs in the electronics industry for more than 15 years. Her education includes a double bachelor's of arts in chemistry and biology at Fresno State University in Fresno, California. Also joining us today is Dr. Jonathan Beck. Dr. Beck received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Missouri, Columbia, working on a Maldi Toff MSMS instruments investigating surface induced dissociation of peptides. Jonathan has spent the past eight years at Thermo Fisher Scientific and the past six years in the environmental and food safety vertical market, working to grow market share worldwide while primarily focusing on LCMS triple quadrupole instruments and on high-resolution LCMS instruments such as the Xactive Plus and QXactive. Prior to joining Thermo Scientific, he worked for three years at Varian Inc. in Walnut Creek, California, working in the LCMS triple quadrupole applications lab and for two years at Specialty Labs in Santa Monica, California, a clinical diagnosis company working on method development and validation on triple quadrupole instruments. Welcome to both of you. Oh, thank you. Um, that was a real nice introduction, Trevor. Um, so today, we'll just start right in here. Uh, we're going to talk about ion chromatography, mass spec analysis of halocetic acids. And uh, we'll be splitting the presentation with uh, Jonathan Beck and myself. So first of all, disinfection byproducts in drinking water. Um, disinfection treatment is essential to eliminate those disease-causing microorganisms. So we are, this is an essential process for the treatment of our water to prevent some of those uh, nasty diseases associated with water contamination. Uh, the primary treatment of, of uh, water is done either by ozonation, ozonation or chlorination. And some of these disinfection byproducts are created during those processes. Um, for example, ozonation can create bromate if there's bromide in the water, and chlorination can uh, create chlorite or chlorate trihalomethanes, the THM, and halocetic acids. And halocetic acids is going to be our topic for today. Um, of course, these are highly regulated because of the associated health issues. For example, chlorite uh, can affect uh, fetal development and affects the nervous system. Bromate, of course, is carcinogenic. And chlorate um, is associated with blood diseases and renal failure. Um, the halocetic acids, the trihalomethanes, um, are, are associated with uh, chronic exposure uh, that could increase risk of cancer. Uh, more typically associated with bladder cancer. And the the statement is, is that if it's above the um, maximum contamination level, 
that's when uh, they have concerns about the chronic exposure to the halocytic acids and trihalomethanes. And of course, they are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, and uh, the EPA has promulgated it to the state. So let's look a little bit more at the disinfection treatment byproducts. Um, Haloacetic acids, of course, are formed uh, from chlorine in um, natural occurring organic and inorganic matter in the water. Here's um, a collection of the, of the um, type of contaminants. The, the two of interest right now are the haloacetic acids and trihalomethanes. These are relatively emerging contaminants. Um, but also note that there's a whole, there's more than two thirds of the contaminants that are unknown. And it is believed largely from the regulatory community that these may be more toxic than the uh, haloacetic acids and the trihalomethanes. Um, for haloacetic acids, they're uh, regulated by, group, by two groups, uh, the haloacetic acid 5, HAA5, and four more haloacetic acid 9. So uh, specifically, it's mono, di, tri, chloroacetic acid, MCAA, DCAA, TCAA, and then mono, bromo, and di, bromo, uh, MBAA, DBAA, uh, acetic acids. Those are the haloacetic acid 5, HAA5. And as you can see, the PKAs are, re are relatively low. They're all below 3, or as most of them below 2. Um, and the boiling point, are, again, are, are relatively low. That include the uh, four more to make haloacetic acid 9, HA9. We have the tribromoacetic acid and the mix, bromochloroacetic acid, bromodi uh, chlorodibromoacetic acid and bromodichloroacetic acid. So the regulations of first were initiated of, of this disinfection byproducts in the 1970s for the total trihalomethanes. And then in 1998, the, um, the EPA established a stage one disinfection byproducts rule where it looked at the haloacetic acid 5 and bromate, um, included the monitoring of all plants that disinfect with chlorine. And generally, uh, those using chloramine have much lower uh, problems with haloacetic acids. Currently, at that po point, they were requiring that you report the total amount of the HA5s and with a maximum contamination level, MCL, of a 60 part per billion annual average, where they have the maximum contamination goal uh, was that DCAA should not be present and TCAA should be less than 30 part per billion. In 2006, they um, increased the restrictions by reducing the MCL goal, again uh, monitoring the total amount of HA5s at uh, 0. Uh, Six zero milligrams per liter or 60 part per billion, um, MCAA less than 70 part per billion, and TCA they reduced down to 20 part per billion. And again, DCAA should not be present. So we have primarily three EPA methods involved for HA analysis, regulated methods. Um, they also can include bromate and delaprone. Um, so we have we have a GCECD method, which uses a rather extensive um, liquid liquid extraction and a derivatization to um, for the separation on GC. And the the detection limits are um, relatively low, about a thousand times less than uh, the the uh, MCL. We also have two IC methods, um, um, the pending one through um, EPA method 302 allows a 2D IC separation method where you have two sets of columns uh, to separate the, the very tiny analyte, analytes from the large concentration of the matrix. So we have the first dimension using the AS24A column and the second dimension would be for the AS26 column. 
the detection limits are, again, uh, uh, comparable to the GC method. But the method we're going to talk about today is EPA method 557, which is an ICMS, ICMSMS method using uh, the Dianix IMPAC uh, AS24 pre-column and AS24 separation column. And again, note that the MDLs are, are very low, um, 6 to 20 PPT, uh, and uh, for the monos, uh, 20 to 110 PPT for the dyes, and the tries, uh, 40 to 90 PPT. So a little bit more about EPA method 557. It is an ion chromatography method and, of course, in suppressed conductivity mode using MSMS detection. Now, this is a direct method with a matrix diversion of the high concentrations of the chloride, sulfate, and carbonate in the sample matrix. It does eliminate some of the um, difficulties of the sample prep by eliminating liquid-liquid extraction and any derivatization. It also eliminates collution because the mass spec is a selective detector. Um, MSMS also provides molecular information, which confirms the analyte of interest. Um, this method is fully automated, and recoveries are typically greater than 90%. This is well within the EPA requirements. Here's our, our whole family of ion chromatography systems we have available from the, uh, the um, starter IC, the ICS 900, and our mid-tier product line, ICS 1100, 1600, and 2100. Um, and then we have a dedicated capillary system, the ICS 4000, which runs um, our 0.4 millimeter ID columns. It's also a high-pressure system. And then we have our modular ICS 5000 plus high-pressure system, ion chrom chromatography system. Now, from the 2100 to the 5000, we have a reagent-free ion chromatography systems. That means that um, the eluent is electrolytically generated. You only need to add water as your, your starting material for your eluent. And then the 4000 and the 5000 are high pressure systems. That means they're capable of running our smaller particle columns, separation columns. But today we're going to talk about the 5000 plus because of its capabilities to control um, separation temperatures below room temperature. A little bit more about ion chromatography. It is an anion exchange mechanism. Um, all of our columns are made of uh, polymeric materials and uh, polymeric uh, bodies. So it provides a metal-free flow path with, from our ICs as well as our columns and our electrolytic devices. Here we have it, the, the stationary phase is, is a super macroporous uh, polymeric particle, uh, highly porous, and the anion exchange, the analytes uh, attached to the column and then the mobile phase, or the eluent, uh, pushed the analytes off the column. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Ion chromatography does provide excellent selectivity. We have a wide range of columns uh, specified for each type of anal uh, analyte, analyte base. Uh, it ha is very sensitive. It provides a very low chemical noise, um, ideal for separation of small polar compounds, and it, um, we're going to use the, the sensitivity and selectivity capabilities to, uh, commute, to combine with, with mass spec. Now, I spoke briefly or briefly mentioned that our systems, um, our reagent-free ion chromatography systems are the just add water systems. The pump only sees water that allows both um, lower maintenance on the pump head itself. It's not seen any corrosive um, mobile phases or eluents, but it also um, provides a, a way to deliver your mobile phase at a gradient or isocratic very accurately and very precisely 
at the concentration that you desire. Um, so basically we use, it's an electrolytic device. We have two hydrolysis reactions on the platinum electrodes, the anode, which generates electrons up there on the top left corner, whereas the cathode generates uh, hydroxide ions. And we have a cation exchange membrane or connector between the two, and the potassium uh, cations then migrate across the cation exchange uh, membrane and to uh, combine with the hydroxide uh, to generate at the exact concentration that you want. So the concentration itself is proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the flow rate. Um, after the element is generated, um, it goes through several traps, uh, an anion trap and a degas unit to remove the hyd hydrogen gas generated. Um, this um, provides a very precise delivery of the eluent. Um, as you know, proportioning valves are very, a very inaccurate way to deliver eluent, as well as um, any dilution um, mechanisms for eluent. So we use uh, suppressed conductivity. Uh, suppressed conductivity is what makes ion chromatography compatible with mass spec. As our eluent is a strong base, uh, potassium hydroxide, it really is undesirable to be introduced into the mass spec. Um, but additionally, besides the chemical compatibility, suppressed conductivity provides uh, a higher, higher degree of sensitivity because it reduces the baseline down to water. As you can see here, the analytes at the top enter in into, um, as fluoride, chloride, and sulfate enter in through the injection valve and onto the separation column. At that point, they become the salts, the potassium salts of those analytes. And of course, the mobile phase is potassium hydroxide. Then they go uh, introduced into the suppressor. What happens is the um, the potassium is replaced by the hydrogen ion, hydronium ion, to the acids, strong acids of those analytes, and the eluent mobile phase is, is converted to water. And to, to demonstrate here, without suppression, your analytes are, are actually dips in the ba conductivity background, whereas with ion suppression, with suppression, it has a very strong peak with the background. Um, what also um, suppressed conductivity does provide for mass spec is it eliminates or reduces much of the ion suppression that can occur in a high ionic uh, sample or, uh, or mobile phase being introduced into the mass spec. Here is our ICS-5000 high pressure ion chromatography system. Again, it's a highly versatile modular design. It is a dual reagent-free system. It's um, optimized for improved sen performance and sensitivity, noise reduction, stability, and ease of use. Again, it is selected for this application because of its increased temperature control uh, for HAA applications, and it does support smaller particle separation columns and all of our column formats from 0.4 millimeter ID, a 1 millimeter ID, 2 millimeter ID, and four millimeter ID. Uh, there's also three and five millimeter ID in some in some formats. Um, it does support multiple detection techniques. Uh, for example, like the mass spec. Um, typically, they always come with a conductivity detection, but we also support, of course, a UV and many other techniques. Um, in this um, figure of the ion chromatography system. There on the top left is our auto sampler, the ASAP auto sampler. It is a temperature controlled auto sampler below um, room temperature to typically levels about from 4 to 15 or 20 if desired. And we use the temperature uh, control capabilities here for this application. The ion chromatography conditions. It is a gradient separation to separate the analyte peaks from the matrix, sample matrix peaks. Um, so it starts as a, as a gradient of, of 7 millimolar potassium hydroxide, 
increases to 60 millimolar hydroxide around 30 minutes and then reduced back down to the equilibration at 47 minutes for 7 millimolar potassium hydroxide. And again, the eluent is electrolytically generated to give a precise and accurate uh, delivery of the eluent. Um, the column set we spoke of before is the Dianex Ion Pack AS11, sorry, excuse me, AS24. Uh, we have a guard column um, 2 by 50 in front and the separation column at 2 by 250 millimolar, millimolar uh, millimeter, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the suppressor is our Dianex uh, A AERS 500, uh, 2 millimeter, and the column separation temperature is 15 degrees. Uh, the, because the analytes are at very low concentrations, the injection volume is 100 microliters, a flow rate at 0 0.3 mils per minute. Now I'd like to hand over the presentation to my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Beck, uh, from the um, um, I, ICMS, Environmental Food and Safety Marketing. Thanks, Terry. Um, as uh, Terry mentioned, we're going to use mass spectrometers for our detector in this method. And I just wanted to uh, go through the mass spec uh, portion of this presentation and show you some of the results that we achieved with the mass spec. Um, we're currently offering three different uh, triple quadrupole mass spectrometers from Thermo Fisher, and two of them are shown on this slide the TSQ Endura MS and the TSQ Quantiva MS. For this application, we're going to use the top triple quadrupole, the TSQ Endura MS. It's our mid-tier mass spectrometer, um, so it offers the sensitivity and performance that we need for the uh, detection of these haloacetic acids, and we pair that up with the ion chromatography system, the 5,000 plus that Terry spoke of. Okay, just some brief um, experimental details. Again, we're using the Dionics ICS 5000, and we need that for the temperature control that Terry talked about. And we're going to look at EPA method 557, which looks at all nine of the haloacetic acids, as well as two additional compounds, dalapon and bromate. Uh, the calibration curve that we studied for this analysis ranged from 0.25 to 20 parts per billion. And again, we used a 100 microliter injection volume. And when I was first started working on this analysis, I asked one of my colleagues at work, uh, Richard Jack, uh, why, why the interest in haloacetic acids? Who should care about this? And he said, anybody who drinks water. So as Terry described in the opening slide, uh, that's created primarily through chlorination processes in, in municipal water. Um, there's, again, the list of all nine of the haloacetic acids. We are going to analyze all nine of them, but if you're only required to look at the five, um, you can certainly do that with the exact same method. Actually get a slightly shorter run time because the um, the four additional haloacetic acids elute uh, a little bit later than the, uh, the five. And if you're only looking at those fives, your run times will be a little bit shorter. Okay, so our mass spectrometer, we're using uh, electrospray ionization in the negative mode. Uh, the voltages and gas settings that you see are, are listed here. Um, take note of our capillary temperature and our vaporizer temperature. Those are both at 200 degrees centigrade. That's a little bit lower than what we typically run. We have a flow rate coming into the mass spectrometer of 500 microliters per minute. Uh, typically, we run a little bit hotter, say 350 uh, to 400 degrees centigrade. But what can happen with these haloacetic acids is that you can have thermal degradation of the haloacetic acids in the source uh, if you run your temperatures too high. So we optimized those um, parameters to, and found that 200 degrees C on our particular ion source was kind of the sweet spot for all of the compounds. If you go below that, you're not evaporating away the mobile phase coming out of the ion chromatograph, and then you don't get as good of ionization. And conversely, if you're too hot, then you're going to break down some of your, com some of your compounds. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the mass transitions that we monitored for these haloacetic acids. The EPA only requires one transition to be monitored. So we looked at one precursor and one product ion for each of those, uh, for each of the compounds here. We also included four different internal standards you see there, the monochloral acetic acid, monobromo, dichloral, and trichloral uh, internal standards. Okay, so just a diagram to show how we, we hook everything up here in the system. So what we've got is the flow path. We start in the upper left-hand quadrant of this slide. 
Uh, we've got our IC pumps here, and as Terry described, uh, non-metallic pumps. Um, they provide water to our eluent generator, which creates um, our anions for our separation. We go through the uh, CRTC, which Terry talked about, and after that we inject our sample into the flow path. We go through our separation column, the AS24. There's also a guard column there. And after that we can see our peaks come out at the uh, uh, conductivity uh, detector. The most important part of this uh, setup for mass spectrometry is the electrolytic eluent suppressor. Without that device, we would be um, we'd be eluting our compounds with potassium hydroxide and introducing the potassium ions into our mass spectrometer. And any of you who have used LCMS will know that potassium is not a compatible buffer or salt to have in our mobile phase. So that electrolytic eluent suppressor removes that potassium from the mobile phase, and we just have water at that point. So what we do is add in a little bit of organic uh, after the conductivity detector and right before the mass spectrometer. In our case, we use isopropyl alcohol. You can also use acetonitrile, but um, it's nice to use isopropyl alcohol because of the cost savings. Um, a few years ago, of course, we had the acetonitrile shortage, and, and the costs are still quite a bit more. So the ability to use isopropyl alcohol instead of acetonitrile is a nice feature. So we just add that in at a constant flow rate. Uh, into a T right before we go into the mass spectrometer. And then we've got the signal um, from the mass spec that we record, and that's what we're going to do our quantitation on. So here's a chromatogram showing the one part per billion halo acetic acid standard uh, from the calibration curve. It's a mixture of all nine here, and you can see they elute pretty much in, in order of their atomic uh, mass. If you, if you calculate the molecular formula and, and the mass, you'll, you'll see them elute. And the final eluting compound was the tribromoacetic acid. That's at about 45 minutes. Now, the EPA um, has you do a little test. They um, use something called a laboratory synthetic sample matrix, or LSSM. And what that is is a um, collection of various salts that you add to deionized water to simulate kind of the worst case um, water sample that you might run. So what we added to that was sodium nitrate, sodium bicarbonate, sodium chloride, and sodium sulfate. Um, there's also the addition of ammonium chloride to the sample, which is a preservative. So once you, to collect the, the sample in the field, you'll add ammonium chloride to the water sample and then send that to the laboratory. So it's a very easy uh, sample collection, and uh, there's really no sample prep um, all you do is take that sample and inject it directly onto the ICMS. So from top to bottom, um, you can see the, the compounds again. And on this slide, I included bromate and dalapon. You can see those two uh, um, trace number three and four from the top, respectively. So we have all those salts eluding along with the haloacetic acids. And what we want to do is make sure we um, don't send those you know, carbonate, nitrate, or excuse me, bicarbonate, chloride, and sulfate into the mass spectrometer, because what it can do is, is just clog up your system and, and require you to clean the mass spectrometer. So when we overlay all of our compounds in this mixture, you can see three groups here. You've got, kind of got first little group around uh, 15 minutes, and then you've got some around the mid-20s, and then some later around 39 minutes. Well, that works out quite well, because what happens is our salt elute, basically where the haloacetic acids are not. So what I've shown here on this slide are some red arrows, and those red arrows correspond to when we set a divert valve. And the divert valve will divert the stream either to the waste or to the source of the mass spectrometer. So that's the last thing that are, are in our flow path before the mass spectrometer. So what we do is the software will uh, allow us to um, turn that divert valve at, at predetermined time. So once we know our retention times, we set those um, that program up to divert the, um, the stream to waste. And here's what we're diverting. So in this case, I'm showing the signal from the conductivity detector. And the red arrows, again, show where we're diverting the waste. So you can see where the chloride comes out. We're sending that to waste. And then three other compounds, uh, bicarbonate, sulfate, and nitrate going to waste as well. And then we do that at the end of the method as well. Uh, it just keeps everything nice and clean in the mass spectrometer and, and more uptime, and we don't have to uh, to um, change any parts out. So the detection limits that we achieved for this analysis using the uh, 557 method are shown on this slide. I've also put in a column showing what the EPA had as their method detection limit, or MDL. And you can see we're 
we're right in line with what the EPA achieved as well. So um, we did, um, we're able to achieve the same levels that the EPA needed to do. Um, and for comparison, we put on the far right column the MDLs from the previous 552 method right there. So you can see the ICMS method is a little bit more sensitive than the, uh, than the GC. So um, the conclusion for our application here is so that we demonstrated the analysis of uh, nine halothetic acids, uh, bromate and dalapon using ICMS. MS. Uh, the detection limits were right in line. Uh, with what the EPA requires. There's no derivatization steps prior to the analysis. Like I said, it's just the ammonium chloride preservative, and then you inject that sample directly. Uh, the suppressor being key to this application to, uh, to make the ion uh, chromatography compatible with the mass spectrometer. It also lower, lowers the chemical noise. Uh, we got very nice separation. We were able to baseline separate all of the halocyte acids, and we had the temperature control with this system, which is idea, uh, which is required, excuse me, for this analysis. So we had to hold that column in the sample at 15 degrees C. Uh, just adding the internal standards is all you need to do for the for the sample, um, and we get the nice specificity and additional sensitivity using a triple quadrupole compared to single quadrupole uh, mass spectrometers. So the um, TFQ Enduro was the mass spec we used, coupled to the 5,000. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trevor. Um, oh, excuse me. I have one more slide. Uh, just some of the other applications in the environmental uh, uh, arena that we're working on, um, perchlorates and drinking water, uh, and then some of the polar pesticides, including glyphosate and ANTA, um, are some of the things we're looking forward to. So maybe we'll be having those in a future uh, webinar with you guys. So thanks for uh, listening to the ICMS portion from Thermo Scientific, and I'll hand it over to Trevor for real this time. <laughs> thank you very much, Jonathan, and, and thank you, Terry. And uh, thank you to our audience for sending in your questions. Uh, I encourage you to continue to do this throughout the presentations. Uh, if you joined us late, uh, you can ask questions simply by typing your query into the question box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Our next speaker today joins us from Agilent Technologies. Shane Elliott is the Agilent Technologies Marketing Manager for MPAES, AA, and ICPOAS. He has over 20 years of experience in atomic spectroscopy, from application support to product management and marketing. Uh, Shane cut his teeth in contract geochemistry and environmental laboratory, running elemental analysis on a wide range of sample types using ICPMS. Shane joined Varian Analytical Instruments in 1995 as an ICMS applications chemist, and with Varian and now Agilent Technologies, has been involved in the support, development, sale, and marketing of AA, ICP OES, MPAES, and ICP MS technologies. Welcome, Shane. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, kind of a little bit of a change of pace here um, after the previous presentation. Uh, what I'll talk to you today about is uh, more on the elemental analysis side for environmental and uh, here, uh, a little bit of Economics 101 once we get into the presentation. So I'll start by a quick introduction of the uh, Agilent Atomic Spectroscopy family, a little bit of uh, a current trend in, um, in environmental analysis, and we'll call this Economics 101, and then a couple of other trends in elemental analysis for environmental to round us out. So Agilent, over the last... 55 plus years have been very involved in elemental analysis and atomic spectroscopy uh, for the environmental sector. Uh, from the mid and late 50s when we were involved in those days as Tecron and later as Varian, in the very first days and very first years of atomic absorption spectroscopy, uh, through the introduction of the early ICPMS and ICPOES uh, models, and through innovations in, in atomic absorption in fast sequential in the late 90s, and then through to the uh, through to the to the noughties, I guess in, in 2000, where we really saw some some rapid innovations in this uh, atomic spectroscopy space. In 2011, we saw the introduction of a, of a new technology in the microwave plasma AES that I'll I'll give you a very uh, small amount of information on. And then in 2012, the world's first uh, and still only ICP triple quad MS was introduced. Now, in the last in the last uh, year or 18 months, we've also been very active here. 
with three new platform introductions in atomic spectroscopy. Uh, the first, the 4200 microwave plasma AES, which was released very early last year in 2014. And uh, this is a system that's really based on cost of ownership and improved performance over Flame AA. It's a, it's a good alternative to, to Flame AA for a lot, of, a lot of the same sample types. Also early in 2014, across to the 7900 ICPMS, which was uh, released in January last year, 2014. Another step up in sensitivity, robustness, and ease of use in ICPMS. And an instrument there in the middle, also released in, in 2014, almost uh, for my birthday in July, um, the 5100 ICP OES, which is the, the world's fastest, most productive ICP OES and, and the only synchronous vertical dual view system on the market. So that's the most recent product that, to join the family and not forgetting the atomic absorption and graphite furnace on the far left and the ICP triple quad, the 8800 on the far right there, still a very unique uh, tool for particularly for research applications. So moving on to uh, what I'm calling Economics 101 here, and hopefully I'm not teaching anybody anything with this statement, but it's a nice reminder for us all uh, to remember that when we're looking at profitability in our lab, Really profit is a very simple calculation. We take the revenue that we get from running samples, we take out the cost of running samples and any other overheads, and that gives us uh, the profit. And we can look at that as profit per sample, profit, profit per day, month, year, etc. So looking at that equation, it's pretty easy to see that we can increase profit either by increasing revenue or by decreasing cost, or hopefully uh, by doing both. So in elemental analysis, there's, there's a, I guess, a, a relatively short list of, of the major costs. And the big one for most of these techniques is gas. Uh, argon gas, acetylene gas, nitrous oxide, those types of gases. That's the biggest load in terms of cost in most of these types of analyses. Also, of course, there's labor costs and also associated with uh, sample preparation, but also running the instrument, uh, developing the methods. Electricity costs not only to power the instrument, to, but also to power the peripherals to keep the instrument running. So in the case of most of the atomic spectroscopy products, you need extraction to draw the, the hot air out of the, uh, out of the instrument and keep it cool. And also, as you're extracting that hot air, you have to maintain the environmental conditions in the laboratory, so that also takes some electricity. Routine maintenance and uh, instrument downtime is also important, along with things like consumable items and even reagents. So just a, an example here of uh, that major cost that we talked about, which is the gas cost. And here, this, this particular example, I'm looking at a benchmark method of the US EPA 200.7 method, which is um, trace elements or, or metals in, in uh, in waters, wastewaters, sediments, and soils. And here we're looking at the, the 5100 that I showed you in the previous slide, the SVDB system. And as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner in that plot, the uh, 5100 uses about half the amount of gas per sample on a per sample basis. So by using half the amount of gas per sample, we're cutting that cost per sample and when we cut the cost per sample, obviously looking at the, the um, golden rule up the top there, if we reduce the cost, we improve the profit. So we're improving the profit per sample by running the sample as quickly as possible, still meeting the regulations, of course. So there's some other advantages that come with running a sample quickly, uh, with reducing the sample runtime and improving productivity. If you run more, if you increase productivity, you're able to run more samples, which is a pretty obvious one. And as we can see from the, um, the magic formula up there, if you increase the number of samples you run, you increase the revenue, so you increase your profit. And I've made a very, very simple example here. If you run 100 samples per day on your, for example, on your ICP, like the one we saw previously, that's, and you're charging $10 per sample, which is very conservative for this type of analysis. If you can double your run 
uh, capability, so double your productivity, half your runtime per sample, you can run an extra 100 samples per day. Now, at $10 revenue per sample, that would be an extra $1,000 revenue per day over the course of a year, in a 48-week year. You're looking at an extra $240,000 revenue per year just on that one ICP system. So you can see the leverage that you can get there by being able to improve productivity and run more samples through the instrument. The other part of the equation, of course, is reducing the cost per sample. And here we showed previously by lowering the gas, we can slash the cost per sample, improve profit. But also, if you're running for less time, you can decrease the electricity you use, decrease the amount of heating and cooling costs per sample in the laboratory, and again, increase your profit. Aside from those things in the magic formula, there is another one that comes into play in certain uh, circumstances, which is the, the ability to run a sample quickly, being able to turn the results around quickly if you have a, a time-critical analysis you have uh, wastewaters that you need to discharge, or you have a product that you want to release, you need to get the results quickly to get those things moving. So that's another benefit of uh, high productivity. Some of the hidden costs that I did touch on before, um, heating and cooling is one that people often don't think about, but it is a significant cost, particularly if you live in a climate where it does get a little cool out or uh, maybe a little hot outside. When you extract the air from the lab to pull through the instruments for cooling, you have to replace that air, that air. So in this case, air is not free, and it does take quite a bit of power, electricity, and cost to uh, keep the lab environment at the optimal condition, not only for the instrumentation, but also for your operators. And aside from those heating and cooling and extracting, uh, of course, you have to run the instrument. So the power draw from the instrument also has to be taken into account. And there's a little example there in the table. So for the 5100, again, using that same consistent example, the extraction required there at 2.5 cubic metres per minute is less than half a lot of the other systems that, uh, that are available in the, in the same space. So you have to replace much less air in the lab and you reduce your costs. The other obvious one on the right is the power draw. So with a lower power draw on the instrument, you're also reducing your electricity costs, reducing your cost per sample, and improving your profit. The other one here uh, is making sure you choose the configuration to reduce your costs. And here, again, by reducing your costs, you can improve your profit. In this case, on the right-hand side, you can see a vertical plasma system here. Uh, this is uh, the 5100, again, using that consistent example that enables axial and radial viewing at the same time, and in, in fact, uh, synchronously at the same time, so you can measure both in the same, uh, in the same exact measurement. Now, what this does with the, the vertical plasma, it's a very robust configuration, so you reduce your maintenance and increase your uptime of your instrument, reduce the consumables costs by having a longer torch lifetime and um, it's, a, it's about a five times longer torch lifetime compared to a horizontal torch and reduce the sample prep behind matrix samples. So the bottom left hand side is a, a very brief plot that shows the stability in a 25% sodium chloride solution. So as you can see, even with that very high matrix, we get excellent stability because of that configuration reducing the amount of maintenance you need to do, and again, improving your, your uh, profit. So a couple of other trends in environmental analysis, and again, sticking with uh, the elemental analysis side or the analysis of metals. Something that we have seen in environmental uh, is the, the move from flame AA to microwave plasma. And this, this is an interesting one because the microwave plasma isn't currently in any of the US EPA methods. But what we're seeing is for monitoring of wastewaters in industrial accounts, they're moving away from the flame AA for all of these reasons uh, and moving to the microwave plasma to monitor, internally monitor their, their wastewaters. So because the microwave plasma has better performance, lower detection limits, a wider dynamic range, 
reduce running costs compared to a flame AA. And what that means is it runs on air. You don't have the ongoing gas costs. We use a nitrogen generator to generate the nitrogen plasma. So it's, uh, it's a very cost effective technique, great for an industrial type application and increase safety. So by removing those flammable gases from the laboratory or, or from the uh, industrial site and also eliminating the ongoing handling of gas cylinders and that type of thing. And uh, ease of use is, is increasingly important in all of our laboratories these days. So using an instrument that's designed specifically to be very easy to use is also an important consideration in this type of analysis. So that's one of the trends we've been seeing recently. Another one, and I'm sure you've all heard this in the news, is uh, the trend towards nanoparticle analysis. Uh, so this is uh, pollution waste generated either by nanoparticle or nano devices or during the manufacturing of nanomaterials. And you'll hear the term nano pollution there. But we're also seeing more and more nanoparticles used in, in remediation, in environmental re remediation. So of course the tag there is nano remediation. And the, the single nanoparticle analysis by ICPMS typically has, has really started to get some momentum in the market uh, in across North America and Europe in particular. And as you can see on the on the bottom on the bottom there, there's an example on the right hand side of the way the nanoparticle software works or a nano, typical nanoparticle analysis works. So by analyzing a solution that contains the nanoparticles, the Mass Hunter software, the new Mass Hunter 4.2 software on the Agilent 7900 takes that raw time resolved signal and converts it to a size distribution. So you can look at the size distribution of those nanoparticles in the solution. And that's becoming a very hot uh, application in, in a lot of uh, areas. So just to summarize, uh, remember the golden rule there. It's, uh, it's economics 101. Profit is revenue minus cost. Now, one way to improve your profit is by using high speed and high throughput. If you run more samples, you increase your revenue. And also you reduce your cost per analysis by uh, reducing things like those gas costs, electricity, etc. So beware of those hidden costs in your lab, high extraction loads on the lab aircon or heating and a high electricity draw. Be cognizant of the other costs. So look at robust configurations and technologies to increase your uptime, reduce consumables costs and reduce sample prep and other maintenance. And we just touched very briefly there on a couple of other trends in environmental analysis, in particular the transition from flame AA to microwave plasma AES, and also nanoparticles analysis by ICPMS. Okay, thank you, thank you again for your participation today. It was uh, my pleasure to be able to present. I'll now, uh, there's some more links there for extra information. If you need some more information on any of the Agilent portfolio, I'll pass over to Trevor now uh, to take us to the next presentation. Well, thank you very much, Shane. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, all of our speakers have kindly provided us with additional resources, and these can be accessed via the resource widget located at the bottom of your screen. Our final speaker today, joining us from Shimadzu Scientific Instruments, is William Lips. William has over 20 years of laboratory experience and over 10 years working for instrument manufacturers. He's a member of the ASTM D19 committee and played a key role in the development of several newly approved cyanide methods. William is also the Standard Methods Part 4000 coordinator and a member of the U.S. delegation to ISO TC147 on water. William is currently the Environmental and Mining Business Unit Manager for Sumadzu Scientific Instruments. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. This is a short presentation that will cover some of the highlights of a recent Clean Water Act proposal to update methods at 40 CFR Part 136. And then I'm going to follow with some trends that may affect the future updates to drinking water, wastewater, and solid, weight me solid waste methods. Again, keep in mind, these are my predictions, and with all predictions of the future, they could be really, really wrong.
The recently proposed updates include updates to EPA methods, to standard methods, and to ASTM methods, and they add some new methods that were added as ATPs. Remember as I discuss this that all of this is only a proposal. Also, there's more to this update than we're able to discuss in the time allotted. The revisions to standard methods are relatively minor and pertain mostly to renaming of methods to state the year of approval. Also, unlike before, there's going to only be one method approved at 40 CFR Part 136. One small change is that standard methods 3113B reduce the required number of calibration replicates from three to two. ASTM method changes are also relatively minor. Metals methods now include the use of block digesters and the QC interval was changed in most of the metal methods. The TKN method includes some copper catalyst data that's in the appendix. Now remember, according to ASTM, any data in the appendix is non-mandatory. ASTM D7284, a total cyanide method, includes some new interlaboratory data, and ASTM D7511, another total cyanide method, fixes a typo that was in the previous version. There are two USGS methods, a high concentration and a low concentration, and an NECI method, both for the determination of nitrate nitrite using an enzyme in place of cadmium to reduce nitrate to nitrite prior to measurement using the Grice reagent. This is a green method as it eliminates cadmium from your waste stream. It is also the first 40 CFR Part 136 approved discrete analyzer method. There's a new method by Hawk called the STKN. This replaces labor and reagent intensive TKN method. The method oxidizes total nitrogen to nitrate using heated alkaline persulfate, and then it measures nitrate colorimetrically. You also perform another nitrate determination without digestion. You subtract that nitrate from the STKN or the total nitrogen digestion, and that calculates TKN. The last update approved gas diffusion in place of distillation, and here's a new continuous flow method by Timberline that takes advantage of that and then measures ammonia by conductivity. This is a green method because it replaces phenolate or salicylate reagent with virtually no reagents at all. The proposed update removes three metals from method 200.5 because of a lack of validation data. Remember, however, that the 212 up, 2012 update allows both axial and radial view by method 200.7. Also note that all modern ICPs are, that are capable of both axial and radial view have no difficulty achieving the method 200.7 detection limits. A major update in this proposal is to the method detection limit. The EPA summary claims are written on this slide. I suggest that you download a copy of the proposal and review the MDL procedure that's at the back of the proposal. Uh, the NELAC Institute did a presentation on it yesterday. I have the link here on this slide. In my own opinion, and again, this is my opinion, the procedure appears to be much more difficult than the current MDL and it confuses me. It seems to add a lot more work, particularly for smaller labs. Again, this is my opinion, so I encourage you to read it and make your comments to the EPA. The EPA proposed updating method 608 to specifically allow capillary columns. Now we've been using them for years, but they were never in the method. They were always done as a modification. EPA method 608 now will allow the Hall detector or other halogen specific detectors and will allow hydrogen as a carrier gas. There's a long list of non-mandatory or non-priority pollutants at pesticides also added. These new compounds could end up in your permits. 
and it's up to the laboratory to establish acceptance limits for all of these new analytes. Method 624 is also proposed with new non-priority pollutant analytes added in Table 2. Modifications to the purge and trap procedure that were previously added in Part 136.6 are now written into the method and the proposal removes the modifications from Part 136.6. Nitrogen is allowed as a purge gas. While it's possible that these added analytes could be used in future permits, be cautioned that there's no validation data included for the new analytes. The laboratory will establish their own validation criteria. I also suggest that you go and read this proposal. There's also proposed changes to method 625. Pesticides have been removed from the mandatory list and moved to a table three with a re recommendation that organochlorine pesticides be analyzed by method 608. Hydrogen is allowed as a carrier gas, and solid phase extraction is allowed provided that the laboratory run an ATP-like validation as described in the proposed method, and that the SPE results are considered or proved to be equivalent to liquid-liquid extraction. Preliminary data that I've seen suggests that SPE results are slightly lower than liquid-liquid extraction. Again, that will vary based on whose membrane you have. If these methods affect you, I really suggest that you read them and make comments to the EPA. Now, as the previous presenter did, we're going to switch some gears and do some predictions based on what I think. So these are, again, my predictions. The laboratory should embracing the new methods coming out that use less solvent, greener solvents, and adapting and accept greater automation and use of online analyzers. Though the EPA has been slow to change in the past, the EPA is now changing. Laboratories need to encourage their auditors to allow them to use the newer methods that are greener, use less sample or reagent, and are more cost effective. This may mean th things like replacing the BOD and the COD with TOC, greener reagents for tests like nitrate and ammonia, replacing TKN with TN methods, extracting less sample for semi-volatiles and pesticides, using SPE and ion exchange in the field and shipping the cartridges instead of water, or identifying toxic bacteria with mass spec instead of outdated tubes and plates. Laboratories need to invest in new instrumentation, and for several reasons. One of the main reasons is the fact that computers and operating systems are changing real fast. Gone are those days of running 16-bit and 32-bit computers. Detection limits are also getting lower and lower, and as the detection limits get lower, so do permit limits. You will not be able to achieve the new limits with your older instrumentation. Laboratory instruments and laboratory testing will become more automated and more hyphenated. Samples will be received at the lab barcoded and robots will direct samples to stations that extract, analyze, and report data that can be uploaded directly to the cloud. Tests that can be done in the field will no longer be lab tests. Rapid development in sensor technology will make chemical data as readily available as obtaining the weather from the Weather Channel. Sophisticated testing such as mass spectrometry will remain laboratory tests or perhaps even become field tests. In the next five years, the EPA will start to harmonize the methods between Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, and RECRA. The demands for more data come as people realize they can get weather and health data on their phones. Their houses and cars are automated, so why aren't the labs? In 10 years, we will see general acceptance by the EPA of online analysis. This enables better computer modeling of contaminant loads and prediction models. The availability of online contaminant data makes possible instantaneous water data to the public. Computer programs and more products are created to give more online data. Much of the testing that we do in the lab can be made mobile, allowing us to do testing near the sample. We are already seeing this with cyanide after the discovery that cyanide forms when samples are preserved.
As nutrient criteria is developed, the need for tighter control on nutrient removal becomes evident. Online analyzers allow treatment operators to real-time control over the removal process. Online analyzers and SONs can also be deployed for ambient water monitoring for more accurate calculation of total maximum daily loads. Thirty years ago, we thought there would be less paper and we ended up with more. However, we can now assume that we may finally go paperless. A generation so used to instantaneous food, news, etc., will expect faster results, almost to the point of a drive-up window. The future environmental laboratory will focus less on conventional pollutants and more on instrumental methods for more sophisticated testing. Methods will be greener using less solvent, no safe solvent, or safer solvents. With the vastly improved sensitivity of new instruments compared to those when 624 and 625 were written, we can extract less sample, allowing us to use less solvent and still achieve equal to better detection limits. There are even some new methods that don't use solvent at all. We can replace one of the most dangerous, most reagent, and most labor-intensive wet chemistry methods there is with an instrument that only requires a little bit of sulfuric acid or HCl. If Keldahl was alive today, it's what he would do. Instrument manufacturers, hear your call, and instruments will be made simpler for all. Canned methods with easy software so that you can spend time processing all that data instead of wasting time trying to collect it. Let's face it, method 608 was good while it lasted, but now it's time for it to go. There are better ways to run pesticides that get much better results, lower detection limits, qualitative confirmation, and require way less sample prep. Labs really need to embrace this new technology. In fact, some techniques require no sample preparation at all. It's possible to take some of those not-so-good methods like chlorophenoxy acid herbicides, among others, and completely eliminate extraction and derivatization, analyzing them along with hundreds of other herbicides or pesticides using a direct injection of the sample. Huh. I didn't come up. If you are a technician, you may not want to hear this. A time is coming and may in fact already be here that there will be little need for extraction technicians at all. Or it may be that your job becomes loading automated extraction tubes or auto sampler vials. Various extraction techniques are being automated and linked directly to the instrument for an almost sample in result out sample result out black box. And finally, on an almost random additional note, I believe that microbiological methods will become less labor-intensive, allowing highly sophisticated techniques such as MALDI to replace current test tube techniques used to verify and identify bacteria such as E. coli, Salmonella, and Legionella. Why continue with tests that take days when there are tests that take minutes currently available? Surely work is needed in this area. Shimazu offers a wide range of instruments including but not limited to balances, spectrophotometers, TOC analyzers, GC, GCMS, LC, and LCMS capable of filling almost all of your laboratory needs. But it is not the instruments that make the company great, it's the people and the and it's the people that makes the company great. So thank you. If you have any questions, there's my email address. Well, thank you very much, William. And uh, again, thank you to all our presenters today. Uh, I believe we'll go uh, straight into our question and answer session. We do have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. And uh, Jonathan, perhaps I could uh, start with you. Uh, why is the uh, conductivity detector in line with the mass spec? Is this to monitor suppression? 
Uh, we put it in there for a couple of reasons. One is just to have a double check on our retention times of compounds. Uh, the other reason is that it gives us a feedback um, to measure the amount of conductivity that's going um, out of the IC. So it can serve kind of as a, as a warning. If, if we uh, monitor that conductivity level, it's measured, it's reported in micro Siemens. Uh, if it's too high, we know that possibly there's something um, amiss on the IC system and we're not sending that high concentration salt solution to the mass spec. So it's also kind of a safety. Uh, Terry, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, it it's, does monitor the health of the suppressor. So it ensures that um, the mass spec is protected as well as making sure that the IC is operating properly. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Terry, while I've got you there, uh, I'm un still uncertain uh, as to the usefulness of suppressed conductivity. Why is uh, suppressed conductivity important if all the analytes are detected and quantified by MSMS? So again, the suppressor does reduce the chemical noise by suppressing the baseline of the mobile phase or the eluent. In addition, it, it also reduces or almost eliminates ion suppression, which is an issue uh, that all mass spectroscopists worry about, that if the high ionic content of the sample being introduced or the, or the mobile phase uh, will suppress the ionization of the analytes of interest. So the suppressor provides both um, a low noise, of course, that, so signal to noise gives you more sensitivity, as well as increases the signal by reducing um, the ion suppression. Great, thank you. Uh, Shane, when you showed the argon usage table, the flows seem very high. Uh, given the plasma on our ICP is o only uses about 12 liters per minute argon, why are the usage numbers so high? Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question. The, the flows on that table that I showed, I, I did skim over them pretty quickly, but the flows were the total flow of, of argon used there. So not only in the plasma, but also including things like purging the optics, purging the pre-optics. If, if you have a detector that needs purging, it, it includes the purging the detector too. So those, those flows are a total argon flow for the entire instrument, not just the plasma. Great, thank you. Uh, now this question is for, uh, for William. Uh, William, have any studies been done on performing uh, solid phase extraction processes in the field? And is that something that any regulating bodies are allowing? No regulating bodies are allowing it that I'm aware of. We've done, uh, we've done ion exchange in the field with success. However, that's not allowed either. It's been discussed at meetings with the Office of Solid Waste the possibility of doing solid phase extraction out in the field and sending cartridges instead of samples. But no, it is not approved yet, and there would have to be a lot of data before something like that would be allowed. Great, thank you. Um, go ahead. Oh, that was my answer. Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, do you see any shifting of retention times, and uh, how do you control the divert valve on the mass spec? Yeah, um, the retention times have been uh, very stable with this assay. Um, we really haven't seen any shift in the retention times, um, and that's really important by using for using that divert valve. The divert valve is programmed through the instrument method software, and we can tell it the times and positions that we want it to be in. So once we have the... Uh, the retention times figured out, the, um, we can program that divert valve and, and um, lock it in. We do offer, or we do put in a little bit of a cushion beforehand, so we're not turning the divert valve, you know, five seconds before the peak eludes. We're, we're giving it about a half a minute to uh, account for that. But the fact that we're using a temperature-controlled column compartment at 15 degrees really uh, helps with that, that retention time stability. Thank you. Um, Shane, can you explain what synchronous vertical dual view means and, and what is the advantage of this? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, aside from being a very big mouthful, uh, it's, it basically describes the configuration that I, that I showed on one of those slides. So the vertical dual view means the, the plasma is vertical, the torch is vertical, but we're viewing both axial and radial from that vertical torch. So it's using the, 
the most robust configuration of the torch, which is vertical, and viewing axially and radially. The synchronous part of that uh, synchronous vertical dual view means that we actually, rather than measuring sequentially, so measuring axial and then measuring radial, um, we have a unique piece of technology in the instrument that allows us to, to select and combine the wavelengths from the axial and radial views and, and measure them or view them at the same time, so in one synchronous measurement. So uh, that's, that's basically what the SVDB does. Great, thank you. Uh, Terry, uh, I'm curious about the 15 uh, C separation temperature. Uh, if your IC doesn't have uh, cooling capabilities, can you run this method at 25 degrees C? Uh, no. Unfortunately, uh, these analytes are temperature sensitive, and they need to be run at uh, a low separation temperature. Um, we have developed the AS24, and the, there's another column similar to it for the 2D IC method, AS24A, that are designed for this low temperature separation. Okay, thank you. Uh, William, you spoke of the EPA method update rule. Uh, what can uh, researchers do if they want to read it and make comments of their own? Uh, I gave a link that I think will be provided. Download the, the, you know, go to the link, download the document, print it out. It's about 200 pages. Read it as carefully as you can, and then there's instructions on there as to where to send in your comments. It's best to send it on a company letterhead, but the EPA is required by law to review everybody's comments. Thank That's you. My answer. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, I see that the uh, run times are about uh, an hour. Is it necessary to run a complete calibration curve for each batch of samples? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because if you have seven or eight calibration uh, standards, that's a good work day there, eight hours. So what the uh, EPA does allow is for you to use a calibration check standard. And what happens is you inject, it's usually one of the lower levels or a mid-level calibrant. You run that one time, and as long as it falls into a um, criteria set by the EPA in terms of accuracy of quantitation, you're allowed to use. Uh, your existing uh, calibration curve. So, for example, you could run a curve on Monday and be using that throughout the week and further as long as you uh, continue to meet that continuing calibration check standard. And um, our software allows you to do that. You can use an older calibration curve uh, to quantitate newer results. Great, thank you. Uh, Shane, is it possible to use the MPAES in regulated methods? Uh, thanks for the question. It, I did mention it briefly, but it's it's not currently included in any of the US EPA methods. But we are found, finding in in certain circumstances, and I've seen this quite a bit in Europe, um, customers are self-certified basing on based on performance. So they're running uh, an AA or even an ICP OES method on the microwave plasma. Uh, they're certifying uh, locally in their in their local regulations um, according to the performance of the of the instrument, and then they're using it to to satisfy the requirements. So it's it's more of a trend in industrial environmental monitoring on site. So a customer that might have a uh, an industrial process, they do QAQC, but they also monitor wastewater. That's, that's more, I think, where we're seeing the microwave plasma um, go into environmental analysis. Great, thank you. Uh, Terry, the front end separation looks similar to HPLC. Uh, can this uh, method be used on, on an HPLC system? Um, unfortunately not. Um, our uh, IC systems are metal-free flow path from the start, from the pump, and the water introduced clear to the end where it's introduced into the mass spec. Um, and the uh, mobile phase is corrosive to metals. So, uh, and uh, if you were to take, for example, our column technology and put it on an HPLC, you perhaps could run the correct mobile phase and the correct temperature conditions, but you would load up the column with metal and thereby um, inactivating the active sites um, and so your separation would not be as good, and you, uh, it, would, of course, would affect the sensitivity and detection. Great, and in general, you. I guess, increase the baseline. Sorry. That's okay. 
Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, you mentioned a couple systems there. Uh, what would be the difference between using the, uh, the TSQ Endura and the Quantiva? Yeah, the um, Quantiva will work just as well. In fact, a little bit better. You get slightly better uh, detection limits with that instrument. It does cost more money, but in terms of um, instrument performance, really the, the difference between the two is, is that the Quantiva offers more sensitivity. So um, if you have the extra uh, funds available, there's no reason why you couldn't uh, choose that instrument. And it would, uh, you know, if you're going to use it for maybe some other applications, that other extra sensitivity might come in handy. But in terms of this application, uh, you, you can use the Enduro with great results. Great, thank you. Uh, looking at the time, I think we're, uh, we probably have time for one more question here. Uh, uh, William, you, uh, you gave us a comprehensive uh, view of the future of the Environmental Lab. Uh, what is uh, Shimazu doing to uh, help shape that future? Okay, well, we're actually working with Richard Jack mentioned during the thermo presentation uh, to create some methods to ASTM to do total nitrogen to eliminate uh, the TKN digestion completely. We're working with standard methods and ASTM for another total nitrogen method to completely eliminate TKN for you. And we're also working with EPA and amongst ourselves to uh, replace method 608 with GCMS, as I mentioned earlier in one of my slides. Those are two examples. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, if we didn't get to your question during the question and answer session, uh, please be assured that I'll be forwarding your questions to the panelists and they'll get back to you via email. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our panelists directly, as they are the true experts in this field. Their contact information, as you can see, is available on the screen now. Also, just a reminder that today's webinar video will be available at the link you see on the screen. On behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank all our panelists today for their hard work, and I'd like to thank our sponsors, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Agilent Technologies, and Shimadzu, for supporting our Tech Trends webinar series. As well, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Please mark your calendar for our next Tech Trends webinar, which will focus on mobile technologies for your lab. This webinar will be taking place Thursday, April 30th, from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And for more information, please visit our website at www.labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again next time. Thank you, and have a great day.